Jonathan, good morning. How are you? Morning is broken. Morning is broken. It's moving week. It's moving week. We got to so keep things just... going. So that's uh, tomorrow. 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 Morning has broken. Today is Wednesday, September 16th, and I am your consecrated host, Father Jeff, consecrated by Holy Orders. I am your consecrated host, Jonathan, because I was consecrated by baptism. As we all are. How are you doing? Is it's, everything just a mess in your life? Yep, every, everything awesome. is a mess. Love it. I don't know what day it is. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> when life is a I mess. I don't know where I live. It's so much more real. It's, yeah. You have, to, you have to be awake. You have to be alert. You have to be on top of things. You have to be, I think we complain a lot of times when our lives get messy and complicated yeah. and we just want things to be smooth and serene. But the mm-hmm. messiness is necessary sometimes to get to the smooth and serene. So. Life's a little bit, life, life's messy. And it's okay. I mean, that's part of our vocation. Our, our vocation is to help clean things up. Yeah. If, the, if life wasn't messy, you wouldn't have a, you wouldn't have a vocation. Well, that's what makes it an adventure. <laughs> makes it an adventure. <laughs> so are you all packed up? Ready? Is this your last night? This is the last so night. So you will actually have life in your new home tomorrow. Tomorrow. It's kind of exciting. It is. Are the kids, uh, have they wrapped their minds around this? Yeah, they I, They are sad because they like this house. Yeah. But I think they'll get over it once they realize that all of their stuff is moving to the new oh, house. Oh, yeah, that they don't have to leave the stuff mm-hmm. behind. That's, that's, a, a, that's the hard, that's the obstacle to get around is. Right. Have they seen the new house? They have. It's been a while. Okay. It's been, it's been a while, so... Got it. Now, do they do they share a room now? Yep. Will they share a room when they're there? Yep. The boys will share a room. And it's Gemma, good for the. It, I Gemma think gets her own. For for now. For now. Until there's another little girl in the picture. Well, we never know. We never know. Um, yeah. Depends if and when we have more kids. If it's a girl, if it's a boy, cool. who knows? Cool. Well, good. Well, hopefully all goes well. If you need help moving, don't call me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Father Jack. I got a few people that you can call. Jackie, Diane. <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, today is uh, the feast of Saints Cornelius and Cyprian. I think they were way back in the two hundreds. Yeah, I've uh, heard the names, century. but don't know anything. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Cornelius is the patron of cattle. So if you're a cow farmer out there, rancher, whatever, St. Uh, Cornelius, because his name Cornelius uh, means cornu, the, the horns of, uh, that you would see from a, an animal. And so he's, because of his name, he's the patron of cattle. Just because of his name. Just because of his name, Cornelius. Exactly. So Cornelius and Cyprian. Uh, Cornelius was the pope, and Cyprian was a bishop, the bishop in... Carthage, North Africa, and uh, there was persecution. Uh, the, 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 the 200s were a time of heavy persecution. It was kind of the, the, the high point of persecution against the church uh, from the Roman Empire. And so lots of persecution. Uh, there was, interestingly enough, sickness and plague oh. ravaging the area. Uh, and so St. Cyprian was known for his uh, ministry to the, the sick and the poor and whatnot. But there was a giant question um, about all of those Christians who, because of the intensity of the persecution, kind of drifted away from their practice of the faith. So because it was illegal to practice, they weren't allowed to practice, it was difficult to practice, they just kind of stopped practicing the faith. And, And even went so far as to take up old pagan ways. Oh, wow. And so... When the persecutions began dying down and life was getting back to normal, huge questions uh, among the Christian community. What do we do with these people who fell away from the faith? We're having some of the same questions now. What do we do with these people who aren't coming back? It's, it's, uh, it is, it, yeah, you know, have we lost? Have we lost faith? Are there people who have truly lost their faith? Or are there people who are just unsure how to get back into practice, or is there fear that still motivates, or you know this, that, and the other thing? Um, but you know, do do we need to make these people back in the day 
do we need to make these people go through serious penance, uh, almost like a second catechumenate? Do we need to rebaptize them? Do we need to, what, what do we do with these people that totally renounced, like not just stopped practicing, but renounced their Christian faith? Uh, it was a real challenge. And this was back in a time when the church communities, especially those church communities, they would know and interact. Like they would truly Small know. Small and tight knit. So they would truly know if <clears throat> if Jonathan over there is absolutely just, just renounced his faith, is living a pagan life. Yeah. Um, you know the the people who haven't come back. We don't and now know. You now you want to come back. Yeah. Now you want to come back after you just went out and renounced your faith and was you know doing all sorts of things. So it makes me a little uncomfortable. It's like, well, how can that be? It doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem whatever. Um, so there's all kinds of things. And, and as you can imagine, even as today, there are two camps in, in the church. There were those that were like, absolutely, you know, these people need to feel their pain. They need to know that they did something wrong. They need to go through a period of, of reform and even the catechumenate again and be rebaptized because they lost that baptismal grace. And there were others that were saying, no, you cannot lose your baptismal grace. They sinned, uh, they need to be reconciled, but they also need, uh, they fell away because they were weak and they need to be strengthened. So uh, Cyprian appealed to Cornelius in Rome and said, here's my thoughts. What do you think, Holy Father? And so it really demonstrates to us all the way back in the third century, how the church, even then, wanted to maintain and demonstrate its unity to Rome. That we're not just all of these individual ships floating mm -hmm. out here, but there is an admiral that's kind of guiding the fleet. And so there was an appeal to Rome, and Cornelius, uh, he agreed. He says, no, 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 you do not need to be rebaptized. Uh, baptism is once for all. And uh, there, yes, there does need to be some reconciliation and healing, but these are weak folk and they need the grace of the sacraments. So let them receive the grace of the sacraments. Don't, don't create all these hurdles and hoops that, that they need to jump, jump through. So it really reminds us the church's ministry is always one of healing and reconciliation. And we just tend to be weak and fall all over ourselves throughout our Christian journey. It's true. It is true. So Saints Cornelius and Cyprian maybe have a hamburger today in honor of... Uh, of the patron of the patron of cows, <laughs> or eat a Chick Fil A and preserve those poor cows that are being patronized <laughs> by uh, by Cornelius. Father Jeff. Yes, sir. I heard a rumor. Hello, tell me. It's not really a rumor because you confirmed it with your own mouth. <laughs> okay, not a rumor, but you're going to spread a rumor right now. You have never eaten Chick Fil A. I have not. I don't eat a whole lot of fast food. And that's so not that's shocking. That, you know, Father Jeff. That is. Um, yeah, I don't eat a whole lot of fast food, so I haven't had the opportunity. I mean, I pretty much eat fast food only when I'm traveling, question mark? Question mark. And maybe, <laughs> and maybe the occasional other time. So, a um, pizza, I'll get a pizza. So, some people, most people that I know that really like Chick-fil-A love the Chick-fil-A sauce. Mm-mm. I don't know what it is. It's a sauce. It's okay. It's not that great. Okay. There's a hidden gem at Chick-fil-A. What? What? It's honey roasted barbecue sauce. That sounds delightful. It is very delightful. It's it's not on the menu. They really? don't show... It's not on the thing. No. But it's a yellow sauce. So you wouldn't think a barbecue okay. sauce is yellow. Well, well, it depends on what part of the world. Memphis, gold. You know, mm. kind of a mustard sauce. But anyway, go on. Memphis is better with their dry rice. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, it's so good. Hmm. And um, one of our parishioners, their kids work at Chick Fil A. Yes, um, they're underage, so I won't mention their names. Yes, um, I converted their child from Chick Fil A sauce to honey roasted barbecue because it is superior. Well, and so Chick Fil A. I honey look roasted barbecue forward sauce. to the day when you bring Chick Fil A for lunch. At the parish office. Okay, won't be today. When I come out of mass, there it is. Why won't it be today? This is a great day. For I'm me. moving. Fine. <laughs> I'm doing nothing except fine work fine. and packing and moving. Fine, fine, fine. Well, we do have parishioners that work at Chick Fil A. 
We do. The, the boys that work there. I know who you are. You know who you are. Parents of boys are watching, perhaps. You could send them over with a delivery of Chick-fil-A. That would be delightful, too. That would Just be. saying. Just suggesting. Let's get back into the um, C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters. Chapter 13. Chapter 13. Chapter 13. Letter 13. So, um, remember our, uh, just to kind of take us on our journey and to remember where our patient is. Our patient was not Christian, an adult, um, became a Christian, apparently was baptized, began living his new faith, uh, maybe created a little tension with his mother with whom he was living, uh, but that seems to have faded into the background. Then he found this circle of uh, new friends, yeah. and they're very worldly and socialites and, and that sort of thing. So he's kind of gotten into that circle, and we find that he's been uh, almost forgetting his yeah. Christianity because he's, he's being re-immersed into the things of the world and, and the things that these people are talking about and liking. He's really kind of... Yeah, yeah. this so seems good to me. We left off and he was doing the Christian things... Ish, going yeah, mass, doing he things. was still doing all the externals, but externals. he was he was also kind of living um, more of a worldly life for sure. So it was a yeah, duplicitous life, kind of both and. I'm going to both be the world and God, and as the Lord tells us, you cannot serve both God and Mammon, the things of the world. So it's going to necessarily lead to tension for sure. And last letter, um, I believe Screwtape was reminding Wormwood. Not to let guilt grow up into this man's heart, because if he has a twinge of guilt, it's going to lead him to conversion. Well, guess what happened? What happened? Guilt. Chapter 13. Uh oh. Uh, so, Screwtape writes to Wormwood, and he's very disappointed, angry perhaps even, <laughs> that, and, and, he, and he's talking about Wormwood's loquaciousness here. You wrote and wrote and wrote, and all of your great many pages, uh, stop it, I can see through this, you lost your patient. So, basically what happened is uh, the guy was feeling guilty, there was a movement of grace, and Screwtape recognizes this, and he even calls it grace in quotes. <laughs> like, I don't know what this grace is, but the, those, those Christians and those enemies, the angels and, and God, they call this grace, uh, and it amounts to what he says is a second conversion mm -hmm. that might be deeper than the first. Because now the man knows what he had and what he lost, where when that first conversion... You know, he didn't really know exactly, understand things really clearly. Right. He became Christian. Um, but then once you know what you have and you lose it and you find it again, there seems to be a, a greater yeah. movement. Well, the first time you could take it for granted. You almost can. Yeah, and then you see how easy you lose it. Mm -hmm. And then once you've lost something, now what do I do? You really want it. He wants it back. So he, uh, so the man apparently uh, had this moment of grace. And how did the grace happen? Uh, because Screwtape, or Screwtape points out that Wormwood allowed him some real pleasure. Yep. Some real earthly pleasures. So he said, you allowed him to take a walk. You allowed him to walk through the countryside to have tea, uh, and he really likes these things. Right. And he was in a moment of pure enjoyment. And this is the problem, because pain and pleasure are unmistakably real. And therefore, as far as they go, the man who feels them as a touchstone of reality so he knows, so once you feel real pain, once you feel real pleasure, you're touching something real and you're not living in the fantasy anymore. And you realize that you were living in the fantasy because those other things were fleeting, there was emptiness in them, it wasn't real pleasure. You see a clear difference between them. I can see clearly now. The, the rain, rain has gone. I've been singing today. Oh, for the love. <laughs> That's delightful, John. I sang a little bit of Annie earlier. <laughs> oh, 
That's what happens. If I'm tired, you can talk to Genevieve. I get a little bit loopy. A little punchy. Yep. And it has uh, been passed down to my kids. If they get overly tired... This does not surprise they me. They go a little bit crazy, and then they just crash. I think we, I think we all kind of do that. Pain and pleasure. Ow! See, that was real. You know you are awake, and you are brought <laughs> back to reality with a little pain and pleasure. In fact, just last week, I was reading something that the Holy Father said. Uh, there was an interview, there was a book that came out, and he said something about um, the pleasure of a well-cooked meal or the pleasure of marital intercourse. These are things that should not be scoffed at, but these are things that should be enjoyed as coming from God. That he, he noted that you know too often we can fall into one of two extremes, the puritanical, where we have to subvert and repress all feelings of delight and, and pleasure, or to completely go overboard and to dive into pleasures and feelings as if it was the only thing. And that, I think, so just that point, I think that's why the world and culture says the Catholic Church is this end. Yeah. Because they're on that end. Absolutely. So the Catholic Church must be... All the way. On all the, the other. way. And there are Christians who have taken it to that other extreme, and they give then all of Christianity a bad rap because of the puritanical nature of things. I think, I think the world is enmeshed in this, let's just indulge in every kind of feeling, emotion, pleasure, whatever. And so then the response, the far, far response on the puritanical side of things is suppress them all. No dancing, no eating, no drinking, no gambling, no nothing, no game playing. Are no, you smiling? Stop it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but that's not where the church is. The church is in the Via Media where we recognize that pleasures come from God. And when I, when I read that uh, article or that interview, I was thinking of the screw tape letters because we read that not too long ago. Yeah. Any authentic pleasure comes from God. Now it can be twisted, it can be blown out of proportion, whatever, whatever. But this is the, this is the reality. Pain and pleasure, unmistakably real. Yeah. There's, um, there's another book that C.S. Lewis wrote, uh, The Problem of Pain, mm -hmm. I think. And it's in that book where he is talking about that we live in a dangerous world and the part of that reason, part of the reason for being in a dangerous world is to keep it unmistakably real. And that when we experience pain, you cannot ignore it. Like there is there, I am living in reality. Huh. And it makes reality smack, smack you right in the face. So while we, we want to avoid pain, I'm not saying pain is good. Uh, pain can be, as you were saying, a focuser. Yes, last, yes, last week, yesterday, I don't even remember. They all kind of blur together. You know, with the double punch. You know, you yeah. punch someone, they're not going to punch them again. They come to their senses. Yeah. Pain wakes you up. <laughs> it does. It does. So if you're feeling a little loopy, Jonathan, and you need a little pain, you just let me know. I'm ready to give it to you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm here for you. I'd rather you do it through that well-cooked meal. <laughs> <Let's> just... <laughs> All right, let's move on. So, uh, real pleasure puts fantasy to shame. You know, you can imagine things, you can imagine, you can live in a, in a make-believe world. That would be so great. But then when you really experience a real pleasure... It is great. It is great. It's, it's the difference between imagining $1,000 and having 20 bucks. I can actually do something with $20. I can't do anything with an imagined $1,000. As much as it would be nice to imagine $1,000 falling into my lap, I can't do anything with it. That's where it ends. Yeah. A bird in the hand is worth more than two in the bush. That is a true saying. If I don't have them, what good is it? So real things put fantasy uh, to, to shame. So there we move on then where he wants to screw tape 
wants to detach the human being mm-hmm. from feeling real things. But he's now making the point that the enemy, God, also wants to kind of affect a sort of death in the person. Mm-hmm. God also wants detachment. God does want detachment. So here's where the, the it might be... It, you can see where temptation then can come in because God desires detachment and so the evil one will want to pick apart what's good even though God does not want to pick apart what's good. That's not what the kind of detachment. So when you hear death to self, Jonathan, what does that mean? When, when you think of like, oh, Christ wants me to die to self or when most people hear that, what do you suppose most people think of when they think of death to self? What most people think what of? most people would think of that I can't do what I enjoy anymore that I have to change because I'm not good enough um, and that almost that I need to become like the other Christians or whatever that to follow and seek God I have to give up my I have to give up I can't be an individual yeah yeah that that might be it that that in death to self is um, I have to. I think the big thing is if I enjoy doing it, I can't have it. I've got to get rid of it. Right. You know. Which would, that's how those Christians that the puritanical the Puritan, side. Yep. yep. You must get rid of it. Extreme death to self. They they took that maybe a little too a little too far and far. A little too far. Screwtape points out that God really does like us. Oh. He really does like those little vermin. And he sets the he, he sets an absurd value on the distinctiveness of every one of them. That he loves you, I'm gonna quote Mr. Rogers now, just the way you are. And that is that that that, that it's it's amazing and ridiculous to the to the to the devil. So when God talks of death to self, he means only abandoning the clamor of the self-will. And once they do that, he gives them back all their personality and when they are fully gods, they will be more themselves than ever. When a human being sacrifices his will to God, they become more like God and therefore become more like themselves. So death to self is if you give me your selfishness, your wit, your your own little I'm in the center of the universeness, and if you get rid of that, then you become what God really, really wants you to be, because now you are properly in a relationship with Him. So it's really ripping away all the attachments we have that keep us from God. Yes. And so that's, you know, I think it's St. Irenaeus, maybe. The glory of God is made fully alive. It might not have been a saint at all. But. Um, that the, sounds familiar. I cannot place it is the a saint quote, right away. And I don't remember. Yes. It, but the glory of God is man fully alive. Right. So when someone is fully detached of those things that keep them from God, that is man fully alive. That is how you truly live. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's that. It's that. That that death to self is like it feels like if I give if I give up my pride, my self will, my way, and I accept God's will and God's plan and God's way, that I am going to lose who I really am. But the reality is I am going to become more authentic in who I really am. All right. We had a spiritual director in seminary who uh, who would tell us that. God, when we talk about death to self, God does not want you to put to death those things that are really and truly good and authentic. God wants you to put to death those things that are not you. So that which is not you, but that you are claiming is you, needs to die. That's the death to self that he's talking about. Those things that are not truly, authentically because I think sometimes we even let our sin define who we are. Yes. Yes. And that's the opposite of the truth. Sin is not who you are. 
Sin is precisely who you are not. And but and but we can we can think of ourselves as a sinner. I can think of myself as a gambler or an alcoholic or a sexaholic or a, a jerk or whatever, a monster. And, and, and we even do that to other people, mm-hmm. particularly when we want to destroy them. We take away their humanity. And we do this, especially in those big trials uh, that you know get national attention and there's some maybe uh, serial killer or serial rapist. Mm-hmm. We don't talk about them by name or as a person. We might call them a monster. No. You know, that that monster did this. Because we want to strip them of everything that is good and make them into their sin. And we, we do that to ourselves and we do that to each other. Well, that's why, you know, the, the death penalty is, you know, under pretty much any circumstance in the world now, mm-hmm. it goes against Catholic teaching because... That person is still a person. It says you are irredeemable, that you must be destroyed. There's nothing worth saving. And you are judging them to that point then, even though there is a no one goes from an innocent little boy <laughs> to, you could even say Adolf Hitler. Right. There are things that happened in his life that made him who he was. And that certain choices that we make, of course. Yeah, I'm not saying he was completely innocent. Circumstances also. But that there is decisions and other things and many things failed in order for him to get to where he ended up. And, and the, you know, he ended up dying, I think, in the war. And so that, that's self-defense or whatever. That's not judge, trial, whatever. They, we didn't, it wasn't death penalty, per se, of... Jonathan, you're wandering. I am. Anyway, what's your point? He is still human. God... As bad as he was, God still loved him and wanted him to repent and to be in union As with he him. does all of us. All of us. Every one of us are a sinner and Jesus died for us to redeem us. And so to have the opportunity to repent, if you did not have the opportunity to repent from your sin, how horrible would that be? I mean, it's just that, that so the, the opportunity to repent is, is what this man found, is what the patient found mm-hmm. here. And you can see how, how the evil one hates it. So what, what he wants to go on and say is that when God wants us to die to ourself, he really does want to celebrate who we are individually because each one of us are a reflection of the divine. So just like all of the angels... Each angel, in its own way, reflects an aspect of God. So, too, every human being, in in his or her own way, reflects an aspect of God. And so, what, what the evil one wants to do, then, is not make people true to themselves, but false to themselves. Mm-hmm. So, he says here, you want... You should always try to make your patient abandon the people or the food or the books that he really likes in favor of the best people, the right food, the important books. So you want him to, don't don't read those things that you enjoy. Don't watch those programs that you enjoy. Don't hang out with the people you enjoy. You should be looked like, what is everybody else reading? What is everybody else talking about? Who are the people that I should be following? You know, and, and so it, it becomes more of a, a chasing after the crowd. Lose yourself in the crowd yeah. rather than be an individual. Both want you to lose yourself. Right. The devil wants you to lose who you authentically are. God wants you to lose who you are not. Lose that. Just like we just talked about. Just off one degree. One degree. And it sets the whole thing off to a, a different way. So uh, we kind of conclude with this, this important notion. Um, the great thing is to prevent his doing anything. I mean, that's the, that, the devil wants us to kind of sit 
in that middle zone. We sometimes think that the, the thing that the evil one wants us to do is to go do those bad things. But really, the worst crime is to sit in the middle zone and do nothing. Think about doing things, but don't actually do them. Because no matter how much you think about repentance, or you think about that charitable work that you're going to do, or you think about that donation that you're going to make, or you think about the time you're going to spend with your aging parents or whatever, but you never actually do them, it doesn't matter that you've thought about them. Until it's translated into action, it's not real. It's not real. Again, you're living in a fantasy. And if it's not real, it doesn't exist. Keep them out of choice. We are most like God when we choose things. And that's why the Lord in the book of Revelation says, hot or cold, good or evil, but lukewarm and in the middle, and I will vomit you out of my mouth, because that is the least like God. Choosing something, an act of the will, is the most like God. God, God is constant action. There's it's constant not, being. Constant being. But there, there's, it's constant reality. It's not, he didn't think about making the world. He made the world. Right. He loves us actively. His, act, his being and doing are related. And, and that's what ours have to be too. It can't just be here. It's also got to be here. I've got to do and make it real. It's always active. Always. He's loving, actively loving us when we get to heaven. We will actively be praising and adoring. We're not just thinking about it. We're not just thinking about it. We are putting, we are choosing it. And that's the big point. Choose it. Choose it and do it. To quote a shoe brand, just do it. Just do it. Don't just think about it. <laughs> My title, Death to Self to Possess the Self. Oh. I was in a singing mood. I've decided I will just start doing my titles after we discuss and things. <laughs> so at one point, back to life, back to reality came to mind. And it would have, it, it is very pertinent. But then John 10, 10, I came so they may have life and may have it to the, and they may, I came so they may have life and might have it to the full. There you go. Don't live in the fantasy. Choose something. Actively do it. All right. Have yourself a good rest of the day. It's going to be a busy one. It's going to be busy. Tomorrow is your last night in the house. Mm -hmm. So tomorrow we will uh, we'll celebrate new beginnings. New beginnings. All right. Bye.